bring glad tidings to the poor and to proclaim liberty to captives. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus began speaking in the synagogue, saying, Today, the scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Isn't this the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me this proverb. Physician, cure yourself and say, Do hear in your native place, the things that we heard were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their own town had been built to hurl him down headlong. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. I've been a priest for 23 years, and I've officiated at many weddings. And I would say to you that most of the weddings that I've officiated at, the couples have chosen this second reading. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not pompous, love is this, love is that. But you know what? They choose it for a much different reason than the full context of what Paul is trying to say. They choose it because they're in love. They're in love. But like Paul said in the second reading, he said, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I began to think differently. And I would say that it's true for each and every one of us. When we're young, you know, when I was 18, I had all the answers. And now I'm going to be 71, and I have more questions than I do answers. Life has a way of making things clear. This is why St. Paul says in the second reading, we see only partially. We know and understand only partially. And then he uses the example of a mirror. And that needs to be placed into its proper context because back in the days of St. Paul, mirrors were made of bronze and copper. They were not these things that we look into today. And so when you looked into the mirror, the reflection the mirror gave was very cloudy. It was not clear. And so Paul says we see indiscriminately. We see only partially. We understand and know only partially. Most especially, he says, with the things of God. 
with the things of God. It's very interesting that in the gospel, Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth, where he grew up, where everybody knew him, knew his family, knew his mother, his foster father Joseph, his cousins. They were a close-knit group. And they've been hearing about all of these things that he's been doing as an itinerant preacher, going from place to place to place as he's proclaiming the gospel because the gospel was always accompanied by signs and wonders. And so he comes home. And they want to see the stuff. And because... They are very familiar with him. Their familiarity breeds contempt. We know who this is. This is the son of Joseph. The son of Mary. They could not get beyond flesh and blood. They could not get beyond flesh and blood. And so he quotes the scripture. Surely, you'll tell me, physician, heal yourself. And then he begins to quote the prophets. And basically saying that God blessed the Gentiles and it wasn't to the Jewish people. And they become furious. And they want to throw him off the cliff. They want to throw him off the cliff because they could not get beyond flesh and blood. We are celebrating still Christmas. I know all the decorations are gone. They were gone the day of Christmas. But this is still the Christmas season. It does not end until Wednesday, February 2nd, Candlemas Day. And on Christmas, we celebrate the eternal truth that the Word became flesh and came to dwell among us. That the Son of God took upon Himself our humanity, our flesh and blood. That the second person of the Blessed Trinity, this divine person, takes upon Himself our human nature. He comes into the world to save us. But he cannot save those who will not accept him. And we must accept him in faith and in hope. And that's why St. Paul says in the second reading, there are three things that last. Faith, hope, and love. And he says faith and hope is going away. And faith and hope is going to go away because he said when the perfect comes, and there's only one who's perfect, Christ, and when Christ comes again, we will not need faith and hope because he will be here. We will see him as he is and we will be like him. Paul says that what lasts, what what is eternal, is love. But it's not the kind of love that we think. It's agape. You see, the Greeks had four words for love. We've got one. My mom and dad got married in 1948. They walked down the same aisle that many of you do when you get married. They made all kinds of promises to each other. I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. No one understands what those words mean when they promise those things here. Nobody does until you have to experience it. It was only when my father could no longer dress himself, bathe himself, and feed himself, and my mother had to do it for him, then it became very clear what she had promised there.
When I was 18, I thought like I was 18, but when I grew up and became a man, and life hit me in the face, and I had to deal with life on life's terms, then I began to realize I had not all the answers. I didn't have all the answers. In a few moments, we're going to transition from liturgy of the Word to liturgy of the Eucharist, and bread and wine is going to be placed on the altar, and the priest calls down the Spirit. And those gifts of bread and wine are changed, transformed, transubstantiated. At the end of the prayer, at the, God, at the great Amen, the priest raises the gifts, raises Jesus, and says, Behold the Lamb of God. And what do you see? You see the appearance of bread. That's what you see. The appearance of bread. To, be, to see beyond the appearance of bread, you need to have faith and hope that what the church teaches, that what Jesus has said to us about himself in the bread and wine that becomes his precious body and blood is true. This is what the world cannot accept, my brothers and sisters. They cannot get beyond what they appear as to be as bread and wine. It is the reason why we have all kinds of empty seats in church today. Not necessarily today, but today. Because people see only partially we do not understand. We lack clarity. There was a time when we came to Mass and everybody understood why we were here. We were here to offer sacrifice, all of us. Paul said last week in chapter 12, you are the body of Christ individually each a member of the body and every member has a function every member has a role my role is to act as head your role is to exercise your common priesthood and along with me in my ministerial priesthood the whole Christ is present and we together are offering the sacrifice of the Son to the Father for the sins of the world. That's why we're here. That is full and active participation. What's happened as a result of much of the confusion of unintended consequences in the last 50 years is that all of a sudden, we just share this communal meal together. There is an aspect of that, but it's not why we're here. We need to teach this stuff. It is why, in the first reading, God says to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. My plan for you was to dedicate you, to appoint you as a prophet, to go to the people, to teach them, to tell them what they do not necessarily understand, to explain to them and make clear to them what they cannot see. Jesus, too, is a great prophet, but more than a prophet. He's the son of the living God. He is God incarnate. And so, Paul says, for the time being, for the time being, faith and hope have to carry us and love, agape love, self-sacrificing love, is what gets us across the finish line. 
But when the perfect comes, when Christ, who is perfect, and although he was the Son of God, he learned how hard it was to bend his human will to that of the will of the Father. And when he was made perfect, when his human nature was made perfect on the cross, then he was ready to offer the sacrifice to the Father. And when he comes again and we see him as he is, then we will see clearly, we will understand, Paul says, because we will see him as he is and we will be like him. And then he says, faith and hope will fade away. It will not be necessary, but love will remain. Love will remain. And so my brothers and sisters, what we are here for this morning is to offer agape in faith and in hope. In faith and in hope. We see indiscriminately. We see only partially. That is why when we move ahead into the future, as the world has chosen to do, without God, we only move into the darkness because God is light and in him there is no darkness. Without the truth of the gospel, there's no light. And that's as good as it gets out there. Faith, hope, and love prevail, but in the end, what lasts is agape love.